Jesus never promised that things would get easier if we simply accepted a wonderful plan. He actually said that becoming a Christian would make things harder. He said, brother will deliver up brother to death and a father his child, and that children will rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death, and that all men would hate you because of my name's sake. Can you imagine that? People hating you because you're a Christian, and then your own family members putting you to death. Jesus then said there would come a time when people would think they're doing God a favor by putting you to death. That does not sound like a very wonderful plan. But didn't Jesus promise an abundant life? Didn't he say, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly? Doesn't that mean we're promised a happy life? Well, no. The word abundant just means full. And the apostle Paul did have an abundant life. His life was full. Stonings, shipwreck, imprisonment. I mean, it was full, but it wasn't full of the things that we would call wonderful. Let's now look at the fate of most of the disciples. Philip was crucified. Matthew was beheaded. Barnabas was burned to death. Mark was dragged to death. James the Less was clubbed to death. Paul was beheaded. Peter was crucified. Andrew was crucified. Thomas was speared to death. Luke was hanged. And it didn't stop there. Stephen was stoned. Other Christians have been thrown to lions, burned at the stake. And Fox's Book of Martyrs tells us of multitudes that have been killed for the gospel's sake. The Bible says of those who loved God, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Hebrews 11.37 According to Christians in Crisis, in the last 2,000 years, an estimated 43 million Christians have been martyred. Over 50% of these were in the last century alone. So can you see the disconnect with that message? If we're telling people that coming to Christ will take away their problems and make them happy, that won't make sense when they come to church and see that many Christians are having trouble, problems, and even tragedy in their life. We're promising non-Christians a bed of roses and they see that many of us are sitting on a seat of thorns. The Christian life is full of red seas, fiery furnaces, and lion's dens. And God is there with us in the midst of those trials to help us through. But to tell a non-Christian that those things won't exist for them is just not being honest. Imagine, Islamic soldiers force your 10-year-old son to gather wood for a fire. The soldiers pressure him to convert to Islam. When he refuses, he's thrown on the burning wood he collected and left to die. They told me I would be released if I became a Muslim. I told them that was not possible. I am a Christian, so they threw me on the fire. Your son escapes, but the scars remain, a reminder of his sacrifice. Imagine. Your teenage daughter goes to Bible camp. On the second day, the students are attacked. One of the attackers secures her hands behind her back, while another holds a piece of broken glass to her stomach. She's told to deny Christ. I did not answer him, so he pressed the glass harder against me. Do you believe your God can help you? He asked. Dripped with fear, she cries out, Help me, Lord, I do not want to deny you. Imagine. Your pastor has refused to register his church with the government. During the service, he's dragged from the church and beaten by the local police. When the officers find a Bible hidden in his shirt, he's beaten with it. After returning home, I felt pain all over my body. It was almost numb at the beginning, but later became so painful that I could not sleep. It is the fifth time he's been arrested. If he's caught again, the police say they will kill him. Every day, thousands of Christians are persecuted for their faith. Hundreds are martyred, about one every three minutes. They're not heroes or statistics. They're family. In over 40 nations around the globe, our family is assaulted for their testimony of Jesus Christ. In most instances, the persecution could have been averted if they had simply denied Christ. 
But they didn't, and they won't. In Sudan, an Islamic army set on jihad, or holy war, has systematically targeted Christians. Death and suffering can be seen throughout the countryside. Countless Christians are being displaced within their own country, fleeing from persecution. They've lost everything, often arriving at refugee camps with nothing more than the clothes on their backs. In spite of heavy persecution, the church in Sudan continues growing at astonishing rates. Many of the believers bear the scars of their faith, but they also bear a testimony to God's faithfulness. Over 500 churches have been destroyed in Indonesia. On the island of Ambon, Christians have been massacred in a so-called religious cleansing by radical Muslims. Facing increased persecution, pastors in Jakarta have encouraged their congregations to stand firm, confident that their suffering is a prelude to coming revival. With the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, many have hailed its defeat. But Christians in North Korea, Vietnam, Laos, or China would disagree. Hmong villagers have been imprisoned in Vietnam and Laos after converting to Christianity. Some have had boiling water poured down their throats for simply possessing a Bible in their own language. The Hmong tribe is the largest in Southeast Asia, numbering 10 million. Meeting secretly in homes, more than 2 million have recently committed their lives to Christ. The persecution facing our brothers and sisters is not a human tragedy. It's a spiritual reality facing the body of Christ. Either way, the specter of famine is waiting in the wings. We're reminded of Revelation 6. And when he'd opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And that speaks of famine and perhaps hyperinflation. However bad food shortages may be, we can take comfort in the fact that Paul assures us that no famine will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ, Romans 8.35. We need to remember that assurance and turn to our precious Savior as our principal source of strength and give thanks to Him no matter what our circumstance. But by way of contrast with a widespread apathy to the Word of God in many of our churches, notice the passionate response of our brothers and sisters in China as they receive a recent shipment of Bibles. Don't you wish that more of our people had this passion for the Word of God? You know, the prophet Amos warns us, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing of the words of the Lord. That's in Amos 8, verse 11. We may not be able to stop the attacks, but we can ease their pain. Through prayer, encouragement, and practical assistance, we can fellowship in their suffering. We can show them that they are not forgotten. It's hard to ignore their pain after you hear their cries. <laughs> Tuhan, tolong. Tuhan, tolong. 